Hello and welcome back to Open School of Business. Thank you so much for supporting us and I always ask for more subscriptions, more comments and uh, obviously ratings. Uh, thank you so much and um, today I am very happy to introduce you to a very special guest from Canada, Casey Gray with a Conscious Builder. Uh, his business in construction, he's an expert of construction with over 20 years of experience and he has opened up his own business 12 years ago. So today we're going to be relying on Casey on a lot of questions about how to enter that market, how to open a construction business and obviously uh, what are the challenges of construction industry today. So welcome to the show Casey, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, would you like to start off about your story of how you started and what was the most difficult thing in the beginning for you? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I guess if I go back to what's getting into construction, I guess is where it started. Ultimately, construction was my best class in school. I wasn't a huge fan of school. I did okay until I realized that I could do an apprenticeship in construction, then all my grades dropped. <laughs> so <laughs> really coming out of high school, I, I went yeah. right into construction, started working for a great company at the time and learned a lot with renovations, doing some infills, custom homes. I started running projects fairly young. I believe I was 20 or 21 I think I was 20 actually when I started running my first project for them uh, and eventually went off on my own, uh, like you mentioned about 12 years ago. And at the beginning, uh, I really didn't have a plan. <laughs> it wasn't much of anything. It was just something happened at work. I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel good sticking around after it had happened. So I gave in my two weeks that I would finish the project I was running, which was, you know, kind of good timing and said, mm -hmm. kind of, I'm off. I'm out of here. Uh, and it ended up well, you know, uh, on the, that note, I, my boss took me out for lunch. We chatted it through. We figured it out. But I, I had specifically asked him like, not to ask me to stay. Uh, <laughs> but that that uh, led to the entrepreneurial path. And what I realized, like, I'm a, I'm a carpenter by trade, but they obviously don't teach you business in carpentry school. Uh, and I was once told by some an entrepreneur that they don't teach you business in business school either. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you have to kind of learn... <laughs> learn the ropes when you're out uh, in the real world and what actually happens. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what's been happening over the last 12 years, right? Lots of mistakes you learn on the way. Uh, we've evolved as a business. Originally, you know, when you're, how old was I, 24, when I started the business, really, I just wanted to go out, make a name for myself, make some money. Uh, there wasn't much thought into it beyond that. But once my wife, uh, and I found out we were having our first son. That's when everything started to change. And that's when we started to, to ask ourselves more questions. I was actually at a Tony Robinson re event right before that. Um, but we started to ask ourselves more questions. Why are we doing what we're doing? What, what's the purpose? What can we, how can we make this place better? Uh, all, all sorts of questions really around the, the one word why. And that's when the conscious builder started to come into focus. And we started to become more conscious, not only about uh, how we were building, like in the construction, that kind of came up, but it was all aspects of our life. And that's when I started to feel more connected to a purpose, to a vision, to, to the greater, the bigger picture of what's actually possible with what we were building. And um, I guess going back to what did I, what's the, biggest hurdle, I guess, your, your question. Right, yeah, the biggest challenge. The, the biggest challenge has, uh, I guess if I had to pick out one, I did end up in a lawsuit for about four years. And that was when we were building our own home, uh, we were about to have our son and this lawsuit had started. And it was, uh, it was not fun. It's, the one right. thing I've learned is that the only people who win in lawsuits are lawyers. Nobody else wins. It doesn't matter if I win, if the if the other person wins. Uh, at the end of the day, it usually goes, a lot of times, it goes both ways. Some goes one way, some goes the other way. But you know who always gets paid? It's the lawyers. Yes, we need lawyers. Yes, we want to protect ourselves. Yes, I still talk to lawyers all the time. Um, but going to court is a big waste of time, a big waste of energy, and a big waste of money. That's what I realized in Yeah, because it's the core business of lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> it's not your business or the other person's business. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that's that been a big hurdle that we that eventually we got through. And obviously, there's been lots of other things that we've had to, to battle through. But 
having a vision, having a purpose is, is so important when those inevitable speed bumps come because they will come uh, at some point, especially if you're planning to grow your business. And especially if you start to hire people and you have more and more customers and your people are taking care of those customers, you can't manage everything yourself. Uh, so something is going to happen that you'll need to, to address at some point. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think you just uh, opened up a whole can of worms about <laughs> telling us about the uh, court and, and the, uh, the lawsuit that you had. Uh, so looking back, uh, do you think there were certain things or you would recommend now the young uh, construction people uh, who uh, get into business in that area? Uh, what would you do differently? How would you avoid that uh, lawsuit? There's a couple things. Uh, one is I had the wrong people on the bus. They were they were good people, uh, like not to say that it's their fault, uh, but they weren't necessarily aligned with the vision of the company. Uh, so there were some things that had happened on site that I wasn't aware of that they lost the trust of the customer. So ultimately, I'm not once again I'm not blaming them. It's my fault for, you know, as as the person at the top, I need to to step up and own that uh, and. I wasn't aware what was going on and what, a, you know, being told one thing, what was actually happening and, and a lot of things kind of came out after the fact. So that mm -hmm. would be one thing. But the, the other thing would be to make sure that uh, cross your T's, dot your I's. Yes, we had a contract uh, and yes, uh, it did protect us in some areas uh, for sure. And uh, we've always had a contract on that. So the, the other thing I, I would probably, in terms of a lesson from that one, is, is how you set up your contract. So now where we are in business, we can also be picky and choosy with our customers. Uh, so those, although those, I don't know if I would have said yes to them uh, if where we are now, they did seem like really great people. But once we got into it, they're just, there was always something wrong, right? And there's just some clients that are just not right for, for yeah. business, right? Yeah. And uh, and my team got frustrated, right? Everybody was frustrated who was working on the project. And it was kind of a combination of they lost the trust, a combination of uh, they were just the types of people that they just wanted better, was never good enough for them. Uh, and the way our contract was, was laid out uh, has this hold back, right? And there's some law that we have to do that. Um, so now we kind of, we do cost plus and we bill uh, as we do the work, right? So we've worked through that uh, and we're actually a lot more transparent. Mm -hmm. So your clients these um, days, um, are they mostly uh, regular, like uh, people you, ha you have a business to client a relationship or is it business to business? Uh, um, to client, it's all it's all homeowners that we deal with. Everything we do is custom. Owners. Yeah, custom mm -hmm. homes, reno and major renovations. Now a lot of energy retrofits, so we've become more more uh, focused on the type of work that we do. But it's all homeowners. Right. Yeah. And and that I think um, is a common uh, thread uh, in terms of uh, you know people not getting along and having problem with contractors. It's sort of like this uh, cliche. <laughs> People always talk about it and uh, there is no right or wrong, but obviously it's good to align at least your team with your vision. I love that conversation because, you know, you were saying you didn't go to business school and things like that, but you learn that on an actual case because we talk about these things in school and yeah, it seems like it's just words on the paper. You write out your mission and you write out your vision. <laughs> Nobody really knows until they have their own company uh, on the impact and how how crazy is like a really huge impact. Uh, it, it, it affects your bottom line, your cash, your reputation, everything. Uh, so since you've been already through that journey, share a couple of lessons on, on how to actually implement it. How to implement bringing the right people on? Right, yeah, and yeah. obviously with your brand, your brand right now stands out as a highly moral and uh, a, a highly um, 
uh, I mean, conscious. And also when you see buildings and even that you have a plant on your background, it all shows that you care for the planet, you care for making nice homes. Uh, so how do you implement that to make sure everyone is aligned at your company? Yeah, so I guess the first thing I would say is that as the, the key word there is aligned. They don't have to be the same, right? Not, and not everybody in actually basically nobody in the business lives the way I do sort of thing, right? They don't, you know, uh, they don't eat what I eat. They, you know, there's certain, like, there's a lifestyle that I, that I live that I don't expect other people to live, but there's certain values that I've instilled in, in the business that need to be aligned. And those, those values are on our webpage, which, in, which are, uh, essentially my values that I said we want to do uh, within the within the company. And that is honor. Uh, another word for that would be respect. So honor yourself, honor those around you and um, and honor the environment. And the next one would be mastery. We don't expect anybody to be perfect, but we do expect people to get better. Right. And want to get better. Right. It, it, mistakes were human. Mistakes are going to be made. That's fine. As long as we're not doing the same mistakes over and over again. That's what learning is. That's what I've been doing, right? That's what we do in business and life. Uh, that's that's part uh, that's part of that life experience. Um, and the other one is fun. Not all situations are fun, but fun can be brought into all situations. And as long as those values are aligned with theirs, and they don't have to be the same, but as long as they're aligned, then you know you have the right person there. And the way that we find the right person is we do a, what's called the rule of three. So we make sure that we, if it's a new position that we're interviewing for, a lot of time we're hiring carpenters, so we don't have to go through this first step, but it's make sure you hire at least three people for each position. Uh, second would be make sure that that person gets interviewed by at least three different people in three different locations. And then the, the third or fourth, depending if you want to count the locations as a, as a third one, uh, mm -hmm. would be to make sure that you check at least three references. And if you do all that, the people who are interviewing, we make sure that they don't t talk in between interviews because you don't want to influence the next person's uh, idea or perception of that person, right? Usually it has to be a yes, right? So you know that if it's getting passed on to the second person, the first person is a yes, but you don't know why they said yes, right? So if it makes it to me, typically then two people on my team have said yes to this person. So the idea is once you've done all the interviews, you come together, make sure you're on the same page. You talk about your concerns or potential issues or what you think is right. And then if it works out, then you make them an offer. Uh, so that it's, once again, it's never, it's not always perfect. Uh, for example, in construction, one thing we can't test during an interview process is how good are they at carpentry? <laughs> you don't know that until they get on right. site. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't work out. And sometimes, you know, they, they say the right things and they get to site. And we've had people that we hired that, uh, you know, weren't reliable. You can't necessarily test that. You know, you can check their references and maybe the references they gave you were great, but that even that's not. So nothing's foolproof, but it has saved us a lot of time. And in doing that, we also have a, a three month probational period on our contract. So if it's not working within the three months, like we'll know. And we just say, sorry, it's not working. And we don't have to give them a reason. There's no reason for letting them go. Uh, and we move on and we make it quick. Uh, so the whole fire, fire, higher, slow fire, quick is important. Another thing yeah. that comes up a lot easier said than done. Uh, but extremely important because you will waste way more time with drama on your team than you will hiring the right people. Thank you for that, Casey. So my next question is uh, actually because construction is such a high turnover industry, how do you keep your people and uh, uh, what was the longest uh, time that some of your people stayed with you? The longest we've had i think my two longest employees are around seven years i believe i have to figure that out but six or seven years somewhere around there mm -hmm. and we don't have a ton of turnover but we do have like we are hiring right now we just hired somebody this week like they just came on board this week we've hired uh, a couple others uh, earlier this month and we have more coming on later uh, so lots of lots of growth happening in terms of keeping them and how do we keep them? I think there's right now, like the, the whole, the world has changed over the last couple of years, as we all know, yeah. the construction industry has definitely changed because of 
lead time, long lead times because of labor shortages. We've always had labor shortages. Now we have more than ever, though, especially where we are here. There's lots of people wanting to do work. People haven't been traveling as much. They need more space. They're working from home. So there's lots of renovations. Uh, people are just kind of thinking, wondering, you know, where to spend their money. They're not moving because it's expensive to buy here. So if they already own a house, it usually makes more sense to renovate as opposed to sell and try and upgrade. So, so there's a lot of that's it's good, all good things for the construction industry. Yeah. Um, but with that labor shortage comes a higher pay rate. People are obviously asking for more money and, Although money is important, uh, what I've realized is sometimes, at least with what we do here, is that money is not everything. We don't just offer the highest pay and say, come work for us, because we think that we actually do great work and it's there's more to it than the money. It's actually enjoying the people that you work with and having potential to grow into something bigger, right? A lot of bigger companies who will pay more or have benefits or whatever it may be, that that becomes a benefit, but if you're okay with doing the same thing over and over again, or working on projects that aren't really that exciting or aren't, you know, changing the industry or the people aren't the great because the, because the, the company morale is down or whatever it may be, then sure. That's why you have to pay people more a lot of the times, because maybe it's repetitive work because it's type the type of work that other people don't want to be involved with. Right. So uh, mm -hmm. if you can provide a great workplace for people, if you can give them, uh, autonomy, a sense of autonomy goes a long way. We don't have to overlook. Obviously, we have managers and, and we work as a team, but we don't baby. We're not over top of the back of them watching everything that they do. Right. We're giving uh -huh. them some sense of autonomy. It's not like do it this way. It's this is what we need done. We don't necessarily care how you do it. We'll help you figure out the solution if need be, but you're leading this. So let us know what you need to get your job done. Uh, and that's kind of the way that I approach the, the team. And, uh, for some people it works for other people, as people, it doesn't work. Uh, but that's ultimately the culture that we're, that we're growing here and it's, mm -hmm. and it's working for us. Very good. Um, I, I think a lot of the people who have an entrepreneurial spirit would love that because they don't have to do the repetitive work. Plus, uh, they can choose the methods and, and things that they want to do. Uh, which is great because it, you're really attracting the people who are passionate about building and they want to try this new creative, innovative things they want to try. Um, so I want to go back to your brand. Uh, I see that the Conscious Builder is healthy, innovative and sustainable. So can you open up a bit more about it? Because uh, I have no background in constructions, therefore, as a consumer, you can educate me now in terms of the latest trends and what is healthy. Obviously, I'm very health conscious. And if I were to do a renovation, what kind of things is the standard for the healthy part, for example? Yeah. So, yeah, we've actually changed our slogan. It's healthy, comfortable and efficient now, not healthy, innovative and sustainable. So we changed mm -hmm. that a little while ago. I think the wooden sign beside me still has the old slogan there, if you yeah. can see it. But <laughs> uh, so at the end of the day, yeah, I'll start with this. When it comes to health in, in our homes, a lot of people don't understand what makes a healthy home. For example, uh, we, we need our homes to be as airtight as possible. And when I, when I say that, a lot of people say, oh, well, doesn't your home need to breathe? And the answer is yes, but not through the walls. <laughs> so if we think of our, think of our bodies, right? How do we breathe? We breathe in and out through our nose or our mouth. And yeah and we perspire through our skin. We don't breathe through our skin. So if you think of your walls of your home, the envelope of your home as your skin, you then need to make that as tight as possible, but allow vapor to travel through it, right? Uh, just like you sweat through your skin, but then you wanna control the fresh air coming into your home. And you want it to be coming into your home 24 seven, just like we breathe 24 seven. That's mm -hmm. how we need to be looking at our homes. And the way to do that, uh, there's, there's different ways to do that, but you need contractors who understand that the home needs to be built as a system. And when you do that, when you make your envelope airtight, when you have all the trades on board and they understand it, it's a lot easier. Uh, you can then bring in the proper mechanical system, the fresh air system to bring fresh filtered air into your home 24 seven. And it gets preconditioned. So it doesn't matter where you live in the world. 
uh, what temperature it is. It'll be preconditioned by the air, so it doesn't use that much electricity. And you want this running 24-7. I won't get into all the building science and which system you want. And if people really want to learn more about that, they can check out our YouTube channel. And we have lots of stuff there. Um, but that's ultimately what's going to give you your healthy home. Because we need to remember that uh, even this was a stat from probably 10 years ago. And about 10 years ago, I pulled a stat from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and it said they were ranking indoor air quality as one of the top five health risks to public health, uh, mm-hmm. to, pub- uh, to the public. And that's because we spent the majority of our time indoors and that indoor air quality is not very good for the most part. We spend mm-hmm. on average, according to this, if I remember the numbers correctly, is we spend like 86% of our time indoors. And that could be, it's because we go from our house to the car, to work in the building, back to our car, to the house. Like we don't spend a lot of time outside unless you're biking to work or unless you're even construction potentially and you're like a, a house framer, you're outside a lot more, <laughs> yeah. right? But uh, that for the most part, people are now working from home. They There's oh, days yeah. even in my position, I never leave my house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so are there any materials we should completely avoid uh, in house building? The, well, it depends on what your goals are, uh, from an indoor, like, obviously there's a lot of materials that have a high carbon footprint. Uh, so foam, concrete, those are really bad, but they're required. They're also cheap to some extent. Foam is cheap in terms of insulation and concrete. A lot of times is required in different areas because of the structural portion of it. So it's often not practical to eliminate those both without significantly increasing the cost of your, of your building. Um, but if you can reduce those, that would help the, the carbon footprint. Now, if you're thinking about materials for like a better indoor air quality, mm-hmm. uh, you want to uh, avoid materials with VOCs, uh, so volatile or organic compounds, so paints with low VOCs. So everything has VOCs. If you can smell it, typically it's a VOC. That new car smell, that's via, that's off gassing from mm-hmm. the plastics in the car. Uh, so if you can, av- the more of those you can avoid, the better. Keep in mind that they don't always stick around, right? They they will dissipate over time, but it goes beyond even the materials that you that are in the construction world. A lot of times, the majority of the VOCs are brought in through furniture that people bring into their house after the fact, mm-hmm. right? All the fire retardants that are. Sp- that are sprayed by law onto our f- the fabrics, for example, or on carpets when you do your home, uh, or in our clothing, even for example, right? So those are things that we can that we want to try and avoid. Um, spray foam also off gases quite a bit, so if you want to avoid that in- inside your house, uh, stick to stick to. Uh, I'm a fan of wood. <laughs> if you have natural wood products without a, without a a a chemical based. Uh, stain or sealer that would be uh that's obviously nice to have Mm -hmm. and and avoid uh like things in cabinets for example you want formaldehyde free glues right there's a lot of glues out there that have formaldehyde in them that aren't good for you Mm. oh yeah the uh indoor um interior like kitchen and bathroom that's a whole different story right Mm -hmm. um so uh what would be considered uh, the most healthiest right now, uh, by your standards for kitchen, for example? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. I know like if you're going to put a kitchen, if you can get a plywood box with low or, or with, sorry, uh, no formaldehyde glues and then a water-based finish of some sort, that would ultimately be the best. Uh, and then you, I've, I've heard also that even some granites can have radon in them. So radon is a is a is a gas that comes out of the earth that's actually quite harmful to us. Where we are here, we have basements, so and we have high radon in some of the rock because there's a Canadian shield that comes through Ottawa. The some areas can have some serious radon issues, but if you're up out of the ground, you shouldn't have to deal with that too much. But I've heard of radon coming in through stone that's brought into homes, through granite. Uh, I don't, I've never seen it myself. Uh, and radon's hard to measure. You have to measure it over an extended period of time because it'll fluctuate to see if you have an issue with it. Uh, but there are ways to get rid of that as well. Mm, yeah. And I guess it should be the last uh... Uh, construction specific <laughs> question uh what is the most important thing 
to consider when you're building a house from scratch let's say you bought a, a land and you're trying to build and you're oh. hiring builders essentially as well yeah i would say it's, it all comes down to the team that you hire uh I'm a big advocate for what's called an integrated design process. So you bring on your team from the start. So you bring on your contractor, you bring on your energy advisor, you bring on your architect, and everybody's working together towards the ultimate goal at the end. The projects that do not go as well, in my opinion, are the ones where a homeowner goes out, they hire an architect or designer separate, they get the plans drawn without having a good idea of what it's going to cost because either they didn't ask, they didn't know, the architect gave them wrong numbers just to get the job, try to sell them on doing something bigger. Who knows? I don't know what the answer is. But they go out, they get the, they get the drawings done, and then they go out and they price shop. The thing is, is that when you take your plans and you go out and you price shop, is that those plans are far from complete. They're usually like issued for pricing is would be like the quote uh, or the, the title on them. And issued for pricing uh, is really just conceptual drawings. It doesn't have any of the structural details. It doesn't have any of the grading plans. It doesn't, it doesn't have any of the really important stuff that you need to actually do an accurate price. So what happens is that you get all these prices from different contractors and they price it differently and they maybe include some things that the other contractor didn't and vice versa. So you end up with all these different prices and you're not really comparing apples to apples because the lowest price might not actually be the lowest price unless you're very clear on what was included and not included compared to the other ones. So usually what happens is that the cheapest bid ends up being the most expensive bid, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So if you work with somebody who has, does contracts like us, for example, we're more, we're more open and transparent. Like the, all those quotes will come in. If there's changes, there's changes. Things happen. Prices go up. Materials skyrocketed when COVID hit. There's certain things that we can't control. But uh, if, you, if you're open and you, you're working together, you can ultimately design something that's going to fit within your budget. And usually that comes with some sacrifices. That's a whole other conversation where we all, as humans, we all want more than what we can you know, we bite off more than we can chew sort of thing. Our wants are, are more than what we can afford. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, That's usually what we're dealing with. I just had a long conversation about that yesterday with a potential client, you know, where it's, and it's usually a significant price difference on what, because they're just not aware, right? So it's part of the educational process is they don't know, they feel like they can get a lot more for their money and times like materials are like three, four or five times the price of what they were two years ago. So it's, it's a very different world right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did that affect your um, clientele and your market right now? Because obviously a lot of people who were your clients, uh, if they can't afford, they are not doing the project. Uh, or maybe you had uh, a growth because of that, because they actually do want to make more renovation because it's interesting. The pandemic hasn't really affected everybody in the same way. So I always ask this question about how were these two years for everyone? Like in yeah. your experience, how did you experience and how did you manage some of these things? So as a business, it, it hurt us at the beginning, like most, because there was so much uncertainty, right? So projects were paused. Uh, one was eventually canceled. Uh, so it, it definitely hurt our our bottom line for the first like six months or so. But now we're catching up. Now we have more work than we know what to do with. Uh, so it's, it's a different problem now. Uh, neither problem, neither problem is very good to have. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'd rather have the latter. Too many clients. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, just like, it, like we pivoted where we could, we took the time to focus on things that like the important things in the business that we didn't have time to focus on before knowing that it was going to get busier again. Uh, so from that person, and now because of what I already described, we are busier than ever because people want to renovate. And yes, things are more expensive than what they used to be and what people think, um, but they're usually still justifying it because it's still the better option a lot of times, right? Mm -hmm. So there, it's not like they're paying more for something that hasn't gone up in value. Things are also going up in value uh, or our dollars becoming worth less, uh, which is up, <laughs> which is another way to look at it. But in either case, for the most part, it's usually relative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so since you do have too many clients, is this also one of the reasons why you opened up the conscious builder YouTube and the Academy that you mentioned before, 
like now if you train more people you could pass on some of these some of the work you have yeah so the youtube definitely helps us get clients uh on both both sides uh, that's kind of our marketing tactic that's what we use for marketing that's where we put our time and efforts and and money is to edu creating that educational content with the bigger picture in mind and the bigger picture is now leading into the country builder academy because we don't want to be a massive company you i don't believe that you can be a massive custom home and renovation company because it's a very it's a high touch business right so you need to have you need to have people uh, that are very much involved with the project and get it. And a small team is usually more efficient that way and can provide better service. That being said, uh, we do want to get our knowledge out there and help other people do the same thing because this industry is really built on small companies. It's not built on massive companies. Sure, there are some massive, uh, massive um building like residential building companies just doing homes but from renovations or custom homes uh it's all small companies and majority of the the economy is small business right so yeah so the idea is if we can help other small businesses stay in business and build better homes and we're still accomplishing our goal and we're doing it 10 20 100 times more than what we could have did if we were on our own so that's that's our part of our mission now is to make sure that everybody in the world has the ability to live in a healthy comfortable and efficient home but we know that we can't do that it's not up to us it's how do we help other people gain that knowledge so that they can make sure that they stay in business charge enough and ultimately build a fantastic product yeah awesome uh, you also mentioned about uh, tony robbins and that you went to uh one of his uh, trainings um i'm wondering how was the impact uh, were you already in a place where you were uh, quite comfortable with a lot of things and then it helped you to go to the next level or did it make like a complete turn around and, and you just, you know, you can picture that day kind of story. Can you share your experience? Yeah, Tony Rob, the Tony Robbins event is what changed our life, to be honest. So if I go back to all that story, I, I bought a book for my wife called The Success Principles by Jack Hanfield. And there's a lot of, like I read every single day now. Uh, this was kind of the tipping point. I bought that book. I don't know why I bought her the book. Can't remember why. In either case, she read the book. And in that book, he talks about Tony Robbins. And my wife remembers seeing Tony Robbins when she was a kid on TV on her like grandparents' satellite TV. So she's like, oh, I'm going to look this guy up. Looks him up, sees that he has this live event called Unleash the Power Within. Mm -hmm. uh, this conference and says, Hey, do you want to go to this personal development conference? And I said, sure. Didn't ask any questions. Just said, yeah, I'll go with you. <laughs> so we ended up going to this event. No idea what I was walking into. Uh, it was a life changing event. If he's starting to do live events again, highly recommend if you haven't been to a Unleashed Power Within event to go. He's also doing online events. They are pretty well done. Actually, it's nothing like doing the in-person event, uh, but it's still a great event. And uh, that event is essentially like a rock concert, uh, but a positive rock concert without any alcohol or drugs <laughs> for <laughs> yeah. like three and a half days of mm -hmm. just mind blowing information that as long as you're open, it can change your life. And from that, it really did. It We signed up for Mastery University which led us to another event, Date with Destiny, which is where we found out we were having our son. Uh, that's a six a day or six and a half day event. Uh, I ended up doing business mastery twice. We also did life and health, mas uh, health mastery, or sorry, life and wealth mastery. Um, and met amazing people along the way. And it's, it's really what started the, our, our, change of thinking, right? And, and it's really better questions. Better questions equals a better life. And that's what this event really taught us. Uh, and we've been doing ever since, you know, mm -hmm. don't believe everything you think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, you're thinking it because of some, probably some conditioning or conversation or who knows, right? So mm -hmm. I, I believe I've become very good at challenging my own thinking, but also just putting stuff out to other people that I trust to see what their input is. And then taking that input and saying, all right, you know, there's some, there's some good arguments on both sides. Ultimately, I need to make a decision on whatever's best for me. And that's going to be different for everybody, but it's that critical thinking. I think so, so much of this today's society just accepts 
right? Oh, I saw it on the news. It's, it must be true. Or, or I saw this person said it must be true. Well, that's not the case, <laughs> right? I think mm-hmm. we, we've been, uh, uh, I've had some disagreements. I'll share a personal story. I've had some disagreements with my, with my mother on some decisions, uh, that I've, that I've made for myself and for my family recently. And, and at the end of the day, uh, I ended up sending her a big, long email. And in that email, I said, look, mom, uh, I'm, I am this way because of you. <laughs> and I thank you for that. Right. And, and she came back with something really wise. And she said, you know what? It's, it's, it's really hard. It was a long email back. Right. And she thanked me for how well it was written, but she said, it's just really hard to change a belief that I've had my entire life. Mm-hmm. That's powerful, right? Because yeah. beliefs is what starts wars, right? Beliefs are what is what tearing families apart right now with one person believes one thing and another person believes another. Uh, 100% and agree, yeah. Both sides can be right and both sides can be wrong, <laughs> right? So <laughs> we need to be open to thinking and we need to be uh, remember that we're for the most, for the most part, we're all in, we're, we're all on the same path, right? We're all on this journey of life and, and we need to help each other along the way. And, uh, it's a lot easier if we work together versus compete or work against each other. There's, there's mm-hmm. more than enough of everything. Life is abundant. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It just resonates with me hundred percent. And, you know, for the past two years, it was such an eye opener, how the mindsets, uh, that shift in the mindset can really change the quality of life of the way you see how the disagreements can work and, and you can still be friends and disagree (laughs) and a lot of things. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, I'm sure it has helped you a lot. And, um, if you were to single out one single thing that makes a huge difference in being happy, successful, doing what you love, uh, what is that habit? What do you recommend people do every time they have a challenge or maybe just do it every day and it helps tremendously to become efficient, happy, successful? Uh, I don't know if there's one thing, but I think creating, uh, powerful habits and routines for yourself can, can really change your life. And a lot of times, here's another thing I've realized, especially being in business is that there is very little we can control. Actually, there is nothing we can control if we're honest, Mm -hmm. except one thing. The only thing that we can control is how we act or react in any given situation. Everything else, as much as we think we can control it, we can't. And the sooner we come to to uh, grips with that, the happier we can be, <laughs> right? But that's mm-hmm. not easy. And and what helps me is having a good morning routine and an evening routine, right? Starting my day in control because I know the rest of my day will not go as planned. At some point, something's going to take longer, a conversation, something's going to come up. Uh, I'm going to get frustrated. My new puppy will pee on the floor or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, but if I start my day with a, with a routine that sets me up for success, then I can deal. It's a lot easier to deal with all of the other uncertainty that comes. So another thing that I've learned through Tony Robbins is the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the quality of uncertainty you can live with. Now that doesn't mean that you don't strategize or you don't plan or, or anything like that. It just means that there is, uh, you cannot become, paralyzed because of this uncertainty. The more uncertainty you can have, the usually the more it's a kind of risk reward, right? If you're willing to take more, more risk, there's a bigger reward, but it doesn't mean that you have to take uh, risk that is going to destroy your business or destroy your life or whatever it may be, right? It's, it's calculated risk. And so my morning routine, uh, it kind of helps with all the uncertainty that's going to. So I meditate every single morning and I read every single morning and I work out uh, at least four mornings out of the week. And then I, my wife and I, we always do celery juice. Actually, our eight year old son does celery juice as well. And we always have uh, um, a heavy metal detox smoothie. Uh, so we have these, all of these things every single morning. 
And then at night, I make sure that I, you know, don't stare. There's some days where I have to work longer. Things happen once again. But I try to shut down my computer by 9.30 p.m. And then I kind of read or, you know, write in my journal or something like that where I'm ending with a positive thing in my mind, right? So I'm waking up in control and then I'm ending my day with positive thoughts and a pos- and reading something that feeds fuels me as opposed to just getting up and going into the craziness of the day until I go to sleep, right? Because that that's not sustainable uh, and it's no way to live <laughs> and it's it's not enjoyable that's for sure at least not not for me so meditation uh eating uh healthy habits and reading are are and working out are are things that i think everybody should be working into their life at somehow because that is what is going to feel that's part of living and that's going to help our mindset at the end of the day Mm, yeah, it's awesome. So as a parent to parent, I want to ask you another question. Uh, I love how you incorporated the consciousness into most of the, in all of your uh, aspects of your life. Uh, in terms of parenting, are there any tips that you can share that are also along that those lines? <laughs> that might be a question for, for my wife. I have to give most of the credit to her. <laughs> my my wife is a child and family therapist by trade, uh, but she never went back to work after we had her child because she was dealing with some pretty serious, uh, the extreme of kids, and it was not, not easy. Um, I, I think in being a parent, I, I always say my son is my greatest teacher. Uh, they Kids do what we do, not what we say. So if, if our, if our kids have a bad, if my son has a bad habit, chances are he got it from me, uh, probably not my life, <laughs> but either way, chances are he got it from the parents. Right. And, uh, now as he gets older, he starts to hang out with more friends and that sort of stuff. But as parents, we have to take that responsibility, right? It's up to us to lead by example, the famous Mahatma Gandhi quote, you know, lead by example. Uh, I really do think that's the only way to lead, uh, because, it doesn't matter what you say, uh, it matters what you do, because you can say the same thing to 100 people in a room in the same tone at the same time, everything, and it can be interpreted 100 different ways. Uh, but they can't misinterpret what you're doing and the actions that you're taking and how you're living your life. Uh, and I think that goes the same for our kids. We have to be the person that we want our kids to be, but we also have to let our kids become their own person. (laughs) And once again, we can't control them. We think that we can control our kids, but I think the more we try to control them, the crazier we'll become and the more we'll regret it down the road. And I kind of, and I watch the grandparents, right? And I'm, even though I'm still young and our son's only eight years old, on one side, I'm actually excited to be a grandparent because when you're a grandparent, you're not, you don't care. Like you've been there, you've done that. You're not worried about every little single detail that the parents are worried about that we're worried about right now, uh, because you realize that at the end of the day, it probably doesn't matter that much, <laughs> right? You do the best you can, you, you instill those values, uh, and then you let them become their own person and, and do this journey of life. Uh, and they come for help when they need help. Yeah, I really enjoyed that answer. And, um, uh, I enjoyed the whole conversation. Um, the conscious builder, I, uh, I'm just so happy to um, be able to unpack uh, the whole story, the whole side of you, that it's not just some kind of branding thing. It's how you live. This is who you are. Um, and uh, you're sharing that on your YouTube channel, on your academy. So I invite everyone uh, to go into the conscious builder um, channel and check you out. Uh, so. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think all of us learned so much and uh, uh, wish you best of luck in the future. Well, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it.